Well, happy Friday to to all of us who are coming in here today. My name is Jira Swiger, and I'm the Executive Director of Global Immersion. And today we're continuing our virtual immersion into this crisis in Israel and Gaza. And so I'm thrilled today for the conversation that we get to have. It's a conversation that I've been waiting for some time. It's with my dear friend, Greg Khalil, who is Palestinian American and an avid peacemaker, the president of Telos, and someone who's been a guide for my journey for quite some time, but specifically in these last two months. Greg's framing on what's happening in Israel and Palestine has been really critical in growing a more holistic understanding for me. So I'm excited to introduce him to many of you. And, and I'm looking forward to, I think, what will be a very provocative conversation, but also an equipping conversation here this morning. Global Immersion is a peacemaking training organization. We form everyday peacemakers to mend divides. And our work takes us into war zones, whether that's battlefields or boardrooms. And in those places, we do three things. We mediate conflict. We forge conflict competent leaders and teams. And we form communities of everyday peacemakers all over the country. For 12 years, we've been heavily invested in the crisis unfolding in Israel, Palestine. And for us as a peacemaking training organization, it's not that we closed our eyes and pointed to one of the conflicts on the planet and chose that one. Israel-Palestine is a conflict of training for us because we are so intimately involved and invested in it as American Christians. And so the work that we've done over the past 12 years in building delegations of U.S.-based faith leaders and immersing them into the center of that conflict is not only to train them as peacemakers who can wage peace in the trenches of their own spaces here, but that we can continue to contribute to a growing movement of people of faith here in this country who are waking up to the realities of what's happening over there and can collaborate toward a just and lasting peace. And so as many of you know, I was on the ground when this horror unfolded and as rockets began to climb with missiles over my head, Greg was one of the people that I reached out to right away just to gain some footing, some traction, some deeper understanding of what's going on. And here we are now two months later in what I think is maybe one of the darker moments that we've seen so far. And so I feel really, I feel really lucky to have Craig here with us. So let me invite, um, there he is. Hey, hey Greg, it's good to see you, my friend. It's my uh, pleasure. I just mentioned, I just mentioned the guy that you've been for my journey for quite some time, but specifically the last few months, but there's also been these unique moments where we've been able to collaborate together. I'm thinking about a time when I walked into a classroom at Whitworth University and I'm like, as I'm walking in, I'm like, I recognize that voice. I've ever listened to one of Greg's many presentations. And then I walk in and there you are. So it's, man, fun to partner with you in some unique ways in this moment as well. So yeah. I want to thank you, Greg, for the tirelessness of your work, both as an individual, but also Telos's work and contributions into the world in this moment. Friends who are viewing now or in the future, I think what Telos is putting into the world is taking, and I think this is one of the things that, that you all excel at, you're taking a very, very complicated reality and you're making it accessible for us to understand it. And I think you're leading the way in it as an individual and as an organization. And so I'm so grateful. I'm also grateful for our friendship and, and that for probably going on a decade now, you and I have found ourselves in some unique rooms growing together. And I think growing more pro-human, more spacious in our understandings and worldview, and, and I think more, more aggressive in the way that we want to see peace roll out in the world. And so, my friend, I'm really grateful for you. I, th there's a couple of things that I really want to talk about today. And I do want to just start by inviting you to share a little bit of your own story and specifically locating yourself in the crisis that's unfolding right now, both familially but also vocationally as it's been your life's work. And so for those of us who are unfamiliar with Greg Khalil, can you bring us, in, bring us in the loop, bring us up to speed a little bit? Sure, I'll give you some highlights and then end and with today. I, you know, don't worry, I'm not giving you a full biography, but I was born and raised in San Diego. Mother was a Danish American archeologist and my dad was a Palestinian theologian, born just outside of Bethlehem on Orthodox Christmas in a one-room stone house built by my great-grandfather's great-grandfather. And so his name was Aisa, which means Jesus in Arabic. My grandmother, his mom, was named Fahima, and she was from Gaza City and actually grew up in, in the Orthodox Church there, which was the third oldest church in the world. Started very early in 
in Christianity, that community goes back up to the very beginning and was bombed just six weeks ago, early on in the campaign. And I did not know any of the extended family because she had married my grandfather, Jirius, and moved to the Bethlehem area when she was young. But 11 members of her family were killed in that bombing. So there's this real personal sort of connection to it just from a familial perspective. I have most of my extended family living still in Beit Zahur, which is Shepherd's Shield in the Bible. And they're part of the local Palestinian Christian community, which goes back to Acts 2 in the Bible, whether or not you have attached any kind of divine faith significance to the Bible. This is an historical fact. It's the oldest Christian community in the world. Was, you know, I often get the question asked, so when did you convert? I'm not particularly religious myself, so I don't define publicly in a, like a Christian faith way, but you know, when did you convert 2,000 years ago? When did you convert? I think, yeah, you know, yeah. hey, Christians here think that Christianity started in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, not Bethlehem, Palestine. And the fact of the matter is the faith would not have reached here or other parts of the world were it not for the fact that early Christians passed this faith down from generation mm -hmm. to generation, mother to daughter, father to son, under empire after occupation. So you get it today. So this is part of my personal history and background. I grew up with this real disjunct internally because I had all this family living in Palestine. And then I was born in San Diego, California, and I knew stuff wasn't simple and easy in America, but I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. And, you know, sky was the limit for what I could become. And I always had to reconcile that tension that my cousins who were so similar to me, they didn't have any freedom in their own home. They didn't have the ability to study and do whatever they want. And today, you know, if you go to Bethlehem, as you've been, Jer, you know, you live in a virtual ghetto where all the entrances in and out are controlled by a foreign military. Forget about even going into Jerusalem or into Israel, just traveling between Palestinian communities. You don't have control of your resources, your water, your livelihoods. There are foreign soldiers who come into your communities at night or during the day. So there's this reality of what people call the military occupation. And for me, it was a real struggle. What do I do that I was born into this freedom just because I was born here in America and my own family, who dates back perhaps to the time of Jesus or before, doesn't have that freedom. And so later in life, what I decided to do is I decided to do something about it. I felt deeply implicated. I felt that I had all this opportunity and privilege, given that I was born in the state. and. And I had a responsibility because in my view, this, the United States and our policy and particularly Christians were partly responsible for this unjust reality that my family continued and continues to endure there. So I went to law school, became a lawyer, and eventually I joined this international unit that was set up to advise the Palestinian leadership on peace negotiations with Israel. And I worked there for four years as a legal advisor and a communications advisor to the Palestinian leadership on negotiations. And perhaps, you know, relevant to this discussion is that was from 2004 to 2008. And so that was during the period when Israel decided to remove its settlements and its permanent military prisons from within the Gaza Strip, but didn't leave Gaza alone. And so I was on the ground there. I, you know, for many weeks at a time, I lived in Ramallah at the time, which is in the West Bank but was back and forth with Gaza and know all of these details and these areas intimately well. While I was part of the negotiating team, I decided that, you know, what one of the things that I saw was that that understanding that how Americans, how American Christians engage is part of the reason why this conflict, this struggle, whatever you want to call it, has persisted for more than a century. And part of my role was receiving international politicians, faith leaders, others on the ground. And that inspired the idea around Telos, which is an organization that I currently found. One of the people that I met was a man named Todd Dethridge. As you may have figured out, I not only come from a Palestinian Christian background, I politically it fit, fit into a more very liberal sort of box in terms of how you'd like want to categorize me. I hate those categorizations. I reject them. But Todd, you know, came from a very different box. If you had to put him in one. He was a you know, chief of staff to Republican senator for many years and working at the State Department when I met him, conservatives, Republican, evangelical, Christian. And so, so, you know, we had decided after we met on the ground in Jerusalem during one of his visits that 
what had to happen was there needed to be a different American approach and a different Christian approach coming from our two different complete social locations that the only way out of this was to promote and work for fundamental dignity, security, freedom, basic human rights for all Palestinians, all Israelis in equal measure. And unfortunately, America didn't do that, doesn't do it today. And part of the reason for that was the witness of Christian communities. So we decided to found Telos as a peacemaking organization. Our first and primary issue was America's relationship to Israel-Palestine. And we wanted to inspire a conversation that actually promoted security, dignity, freedom, equality, justice for Palestinians and Israelis in equal measure and to shift American culture and, and politics. We're not a faith-based organization, but a lot of the communities that we work with happen to be communities of faith. It is the Holy Land after all. And, and sadly, many of these communities have been and continue to be key drivers of injustice and division there and here in home. So that's a lot more of my story that I wanted to share. Here no, that's it. And there's so many threads I want to pull from it as I've been listening to you for the past couple of months and obviously rooted in a longer relationship too. But there's some pins that I want to place because I want to return to those. For those of you who are listening in right now, as I've mentioned, Telos, I think is one of the foremost leaders in North America on this issue and encourage you to follow along with what they're doing. If you want to take a very complicated reality and begin to grow a more holistic, pro-human understanding of it, I think Telos is leading the way for all of us. And so, so give them a follow. I, I want to I wanna return to some of the things that you just said, but before that, I'm eager to hear your analysis right now of what's happening right now. Of course, we've had, like, I think many of us who have been following along, we know the story of October 7th and the tragedies that unfolded there. We understand the, the scale and the scope of the retaliation and what's been happening recently. There was a, a temporary pause to the violence and now it's back. And, and it seems to be back with a fury. And so give us a real time analysis. What are you paying attention to right now? What has your attention? What is most concerning to you in a minute? And then I want to dive into the weeds a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's a big question. And I have to be perfectly honest, you know, at this particular moment, I, you know, this morning I've had to take a pause from looking at things because I haven't had a free second, you know, since October 7th. And psychologically, emotionally, I'm not well right, you know, and I think that's true for a lot of us. And then you feel guilty for taking these breaths uh, away and for having the ability to not have to worry about food or being bombed or, or whatnot. But the thing that I will say very simply about, you know, what's happening right now that concerns me the most is that we are allowing this to continue. Mm -hmm. And by we, I mean, all of us watching, we have power here and we can get to that later. And so the idea that this is being allowed to continue is deeply disturbing. I would want to say, yeah, I would want to make the moral argument. I would want people to see that Palestinians and Israelis are created equal. We are equal human beings. I would want people to come from a place of recognizing that human rights is human security. And that's something we should talk about more too, because human rights are so often marginalized as this like loosey-goosey approach to the hard and dirty and evil real world. And it's quite the opposite if you actually know something about human rights law and also security. I would want us to come from this sort of space of moral condemnation and moral imagination for what could happen. But I have to tell you, Jer, what concerns me about this particular moment, you know, it, the fact that we are literally on the brink. We've already got over one major cliff by allowing this massive destruction and displacement of so many civilians in Gaza to happen. Like if it ends today, we're dealing with the consequences of this for decades and generations. That's in the best case scenario. But the fact of the matter is that this is continuing means we are not just risking what President Biden has so often called the rules-based international order, which I think we should talk about too, but we are immediately risking massive escalation regionally and even globally. And I hate to sound like a fear monger. That's not what I've come here to say today. I want to come here and say that anybody listening, particularly those who come from Christian backgrounds, have extraordinary power and influence in this particular moment. And I want to name what that is. But in order to name that power, we have to name the risk. And Jerusalem 
Israel, Palestine, the Holy Land has never been about real estate only, also about sacred space. I think it's incorrect to call this a religious conflict. It's a conflict that centers on land and identity, a modern conflict, by the way, that has been infused with sort of religious narrative. And religion has been exploited and expropriated and weaponized to drive various forces that have a vested interest in seeing this struggle continue or seeing their maximalist cl claims gain some measure of success. But what I want to remind you of is that Jerusalem in particular carries enormous weight throughout the region and throughout the world. And what we're seeing in Gaza connects directly to Jerusalem. There's a real risk that this spreads there and the horrors that we're seeing in Gaza right now are, are truly become uncontrollably controllable regionally and globally. And so, you know, that's what concerns me in this particular moment, that we're allowing this to continue when the risk of yeah. this continuing, one, it's not going to make anyone safer. It's probably not going to bring any more hostages alive more than the diplomatic process, which we saw some of during the pause. Not going to actually get rid of Hamas or more importantly, the ideology. It will actually fuel that. We're seeing Hamas popularity grow. It won't dismantle or isolate other extremists, including extremists in the Israeli government right now who have a vested interest in seeing this expand and rupture. And so, you know, the fact that this is being allowed to continue is beyond moralizing, demoralizing on a moral level, but it's terrifying on a practical level. And it should be a wake up call to all of us to continue our calls now for ceasefire. And if we haven't been making them to redouble those efforts or to make those and then redouble those efforts, our politicians are listening. And this is the call of this current moment. Yeah, yeah. I want you to speak a little bit more to like Jerusalem as a strategic. And because one of the things I'm paying attention to as well is while there's so much focus on what's happening in Gaza, very quietly, the violence is increasing in Jerusalem and in the West Bank. And so what is strategic about Jerusalem and what's the play there? That's number one. And number two, I've heard you reflect really in ways that have been very helpful for me about how the contours of global power are being reshaped right now. Like we're watching it unfold. This isn't, you know, a great misunderstanding is that this is just another moment of escalated violence in the Middle East and it's a resilient place and it will all go away and we'll rebuild and we'll play this game again in, in seven years. This is fundamentally different. And I've heard you reflect on how fundamentally different it is. Can you give us that bigger picture? What do you see happening on a global, global stage? Well, let's start with Jerusalem because I raised that point. And I want to go back actually to something that I worked on, which was Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip back yeah. in 2005. And I want to mention this because it's important to understand what we're seeing today is no surprise. It was an intelligence failure of the Israeli intelligence and political establishment not to see or react to intelligence on October 7th. That will be dissected. But the real intelligence failure is why was this predicted for almost two decades? Right. And no one did anything to stop it. Right. Now, I think for that, we need to go back to 2005 and to talk about what everyone was talking about in 2005, which was the day after, quote unquote, Gaza disengagement or Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. So what happened then? During in 2004, Gaza was still controlled every aspect of life directly by Israel. There were 8,000 settlers living in the Gaza Strip then. Gaza Strip, then already one of the most densely populated areas on earth. 8,000 settlers, Israeli settlers, lived among 1.3 million Palestinians. They controlled 20% of the land. The Gaza Strip was divided into three separate sections. And those settlers used 700% more water per person than allocated to local Palestinians. This is massive if you think about it, because remember the local Palestinian population, Gaza, one of the oldest cities in the world, yeah, you know, and the, and Gaza's population tripled in 1948 in just a few months when most of the people in Gaza today are refugees or descendants of refugees. They were expelled from their homes during the foundation of Israel. And so you have this traumatized population there. They, the 8,000 Israeli settlers controlled 1.3 million people. This is a real problem for Israel. So Israel decided to remove all those settlers and to withdraw its military bases from the Gaza Strip. 
Very long story short, it was controversial among Israelis because Israelis were saying like, why are you doing this without, you know, any negotiation, just unilaterally uprooting Israelis from their home? But it was also controversial on the Palestinian side because if you looked at the plan itself, it didn't just talk about Gaza, it also talked about the West Bank and Jerusalem. And so the same year that Israel was removing these 8,000 settlers out, it was making room for 30,000 more, approving room rather, for 30,000 more in the West Bank, and in fact moved 12,000 more in the West Bank. There were a few, four isolated settlements in the West Bank that were also dismantled. But what we saw is that there was real concern that this withdrawal from Gaza had less to do with Gaza and more to do with Jerusalem. Why? Jerusalem, of course, is a city known to everyone. It has extreme significance to the Jewish people and to followers of monotheistic religions around the world. But at the same time that Israel was removing these settlements from Gaza, it was expanding its hold on the West Bank, where you've got water resources, but especially in and around Jerusalem and entrenching the control of Jerusalem. And that's important to note because Israeli policy was divided at this particular point. And in fact, my team helped negotiate a series of movement protocols for Gaza, what it would look like after disengagement, like what would happen to the settlements there? How would people get in and out? How would Israel's security be protected? And this was with the Americans vis-a-vis the quartet, which included the United Nations, EU, UK, US, and the Israelis. And everyone said at the time that for Gaza to succeed, it had to be able to be independent. You needed to get goods and people in and out of Gaza, to between the West Bank and Gaza Strip and to the outside world, while, of course, maintaining Israeli security. You may not know, but the U.S., we sent a four-star general, General Keith Dayton, to help implement these agreements mm-hmm. for a couple of years. And they all predicted the same things. This wasn't just me, even though I spent a few years of my life going around making these points from 2005 to 2007, that unless these agreements on movement and access were implemented, unless Gazans could actually take care of their own economy, their own independence, Gaza would descend into humanitarian political crisis. That Gaza had opportunity to become something really unique and special for Palestinians finally to have some agency over their lives. But if it didn't, by 2020, Gaza would be humanitarian, political disaster. Extremists like Hamas and Islamic Jihad would be in power. And we'd see this fundamental back and forth between Gaza and Israel. Exactly what we saw, same statistics just a couple of years later. But why is that relevant? That was predicted, but Israelis on the far right won out in sort of how they wanted to deal with Gaza. And so this idea of like making Gaza this mess and actually supporting Hamas rule won the the policy directive. So even Benjamin Netanyahu, the current prime minister, until October 6th, his party and he himself had identified Hamas rule in Gaza as a strategic asset for Israel. Right? That's important to note here. Why? Because as long as you have this terrorist organization control of the Gaza Strip, which was what the UN had described as the world's largest open air prison because people weren't getting in and out or October 7th, right? What you had is you would never have the possibility of a Palestinian state emerging in the West, West Bank and Gaza Strip. And so that meant that the right wing of Israeli politics could continue its drive to settle the West Bank and particularly around Jerusalem and make a two-state solution possible. And so this is why, you know, you've seen this back and forth that Gaza is often left to do about Gaza as the horror we see there and more to do about what's happening in the West Bank and Jerusalem. And we saw the deadliest year of the West Bank before October 7th. And since we've seen 16 communities uprooted, in Jerusalem. And now we're seeing all sorts of tensions rise in the Armenian Christian quarter in Jerusalem as settlers are trying to take control of certain Armenian lands over this disputed land land sale and all of these things. And this is why it's so dangerous because, Jer, I know it's spoken a lot, but 10 more seconds. No, go. What happens if Jerusalem explodes? Hamas called their October 7th attacks Al-Aqsa flood after Al-Aqsa mosque in Jerusalem. They made the determination They're going to try and blow things up. Clearly, they knew they were going to get a massive response like this. You know, this wasn't just some cry for help from, you know, people who are oppressed, although Palestinians clearly are oppressed. This was something bigger. They were trying to actually stir everything up, blow everything up, right? 
But the same is true of elements within the Israeli government, these extremist elements. And some of the elements which are fringe among Jewish Israelis now have some power in the Israeli government. And these fringe elements have long talked about destroying Al-Aqsa Mosque to rebuild the second Jewish temple. What do you think happens if there's an attack on Al-Aqsa Mosque? What do you think happens if Hamas has something else up its sleeve in Jerusalem? This means already this historic atrocity that is beyond belief, that is unimaginable, that we cannot bear to watch, becomes something exponentially greater. And so that's why we have to really keep our eyes on the fundamentals here and say, okay, we don't have all the answers to how we get out of here. We've gotten so far down this dangerous road. But what we do know is any further step, every day this goes on, actually emboldens the extremists, Hamas and others who want to see and take advantage of opportunity in this moment of fear. Mm. That's such a helpful analysis, Greg. And I want to just say too, for those of us who are watching that identify as Christian, you know, I was on a phone call maybe three days, three or four days after I got back from Israel with a prominent evangelical leader who, who was confronting me on, on my choice to call for a ceasefire, not as a solution, but as a next step. And, and in the phone call, that particular leader said, why, like, how dare you call for a ceasefire when we're this close to victory? So like the analysis that Greg just offered us and concluding the bulldozing of the Dome of Iraq and Al-Aqsa Mosque, third, fourth, most holy site in all of Islam, that's actually a part in, in American evangelical consciousness. We see that as a prerequisite to the third temple being reestablished so that Jesus can come and sit enthroned in a house. Lots of problems with that. First and foremost, it disregards the notion, according to our scriptures, Jesus sits enthroned as king of the cosmos at the moment and isn't waiting for us to build a building for him. But secondly, we have to critique any theology that endorses violence for personal gain. And American evangelicals, we actually believe that we can expedite the return of Jesus as though God is honored by our violence or our endorsement of violence. So everything that you just heard Greg talk about, many evangelicals who are pro-Israel don't even necessarily know why they're pro-Israel, but they have a sense that somehow if this becomes an ethnically pure Israeli state, then the demolitions can happen, then a new temple can be built, and then we get Jesus. Which ultimately, from my point of view, and this is a huge critique, is that for evangelicals, through those lenses, it's not even about the Jews. It's a self-serving theology, wildly problematic. And we can talk about that here a little bit more in a second. I want to shift to the use of language. And as peacemakers, Greg, you're, you and I both, I think, are very deliberate with our language because we understand the power of language to, to shape consciousness and to create realities. I've been waiting to have this conversation with you because I'm listening to the ways in which this crisis is being reflected on. And as a peacemaker, I'm beginning to to isolate different ways that words are being used to create a narrative here in the West, or to reinforce, I think is probably a better term, reinforce a narrative here. So for example, I even think the term war is an interesting choice of words in terms of what's actually unfolding on the ground. I want to just hit some of these. I want to hear you interact with them. So just war, and this being the Israel-Gaza war, I think creates the notion that this is a fight between us. Second, I'm listening to during the pause, there was hostages being exchanged for prisoners, understanding that one word elicits sympathy, another word elicits suspicion. I'm listening to even in the media sources that are trying to be unbiased, they're talking a lot about the women and children who are being killed, which is an absolute atrocity. But there's very little, if any, mention of Palestinian men of Gaza and the West Bank who are being killed. I'm just watching pictures circulate yesterday of rows and rows of Palestinian men stripped to their underwear, sitting on the streets in lines, handcuffed. You know, and so like I'm curious about that language. And then the last one that I found to be really interesting is this notion of ceasefire. The word ceasefire is being equated to the support of Hamas rather than ceasefire as a way of protecting dignity and human lives. So talk to me about how you're perceiving language and the use of language right now as a different kind of violence. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I want to take it in two ways. I want to 
first address some of the issues you just raised. And then second, I want to bring it back to your extemporizing around the role of Christians and evangelical Christians, because I think the two are deeply connected. And I also think that this particular community that that you have has something unique to offer in this moment. And I want to name them. So first, on some of the linguistic questions, you know, seat fire. Yeah, this has become a highly politicized word. Language is so important, you know, but, you know, and it's been bastardized because like a ceasefire, like, you know, a ceasefire by definition requires all parties to agree. You know, that's what we saw with humanitarian pause. It's not like saying, oh, Israel, you don't do anything, right? It's, you know, a ceasefire by definition means that Hamas has to stop firing alongside Israel and they have to agree to that. And they'll break it in various ways as both Israel and Hamas have done at various times before during their previous ceasefires. So it's important, you know, to see how that's weaponized or a war. You're right. One of the great issues with the narratives and telling of, you know, Israel-Palestine or even the word conflict or struggle or what it is, it's not simply that it's about, you know, that the parties are unequal, but how they're unequal. That's the fundamental tale here, because Palestinians don't have agency over their lives. And the reason they don't have agency is because Israel controls them. And so there's one party that controls another. How we got there and why we're there is quite complex. A lot of it does come back to narrative and language, but the reality is nothing as good is going to come from that situation, right? And so so when we talk about a, a war, what it means is you're talking about a conflict between two, not just equal parties, but parties that have some status pairing, meaning like right. two states or something, rather than like an occupier and an occupied people. And from that, there flows a whole legal analysis. And we can go into that, but I actually don't want to spend a lot of time there because, you know, I'll be honest with you, Jared, these things are really important, you know, and but we all, all often get distracted in terms of these like these fights over terminology. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is whatever the words are that are going to get the, to stop right now yeah. so that we can actually take a wise path forward that will contain the <laughs> horrific mm-hmm. ideology of Hamas. It's not just a resistance organization. It's much more than that. Mm-hmm. That will contain the onslaught and the massive destruction of life and livelihood in Gaza that did not begin on October 8th or 7th, but that was happening for decades before and nobody, virtually no one, condemned for decades that will stop this, that will contain Israeli extremism, that will help prevent sort of a massive regional and global conflagration that you alluded to. That's what is so critical in this moment. And none of us is going to get the language right. That's what we need to understand right now. I've seen so many different you know, conversations over the like, uh, you know, there's, we have some social media. I'm inept at social media. I couldn't even figure out how to join this live conversation this morning as you, you figured out. But like, I was looking at some of the comments on Telos and, you know, early in and, you know, you got the, you know, you got the people who are just going to be mad and angry at everything. But you also, you know, you also have some like, like, oh my God, well, you didn't use this word and you didn't send it. I'm not going to sign this petition. I'm not going to lend right. my voice to, this, and I'm like, wait a second. Do you not see what's happening here? We are in an historic moment. Nobody's going to speak with the right voice. It's not as important what we say in this moment as that we're saying something, that we're speaking up. This is so critical. What's happening now is going to affect the next decade of our lives. It's going to drive polarization as we see here at home. Yeah. It's going to exponentially increase anti-Semitism in all sorts of horrific ways. We're already seeing anti-Palestinianism, which is never named, but is so pernicious. This racist belief that Palestinians don't exist as a people, that we don't have agency in our joy or our anger, that we don't even have a right to name any of this stuff. This is something that has resulted and resulting in the actual death and right. and you know re- reduction in right. agency of so many millions of people's lives. Like Islamophobia, right conflict around the world, all of the stuff is going to dramatically increase. And so, you know, your questions about language is one that has to be a question that we keep on going and keep interrogating, but it's one that I don't want to get trapped into because it is a trap. It's a trap that makes us uncomfortable about acting. 
when yeah. we need to act right like now. I, I'm with you. Let me just push on that for a second because I think I'm becoming acutely aware, though, especially in the American Christian community, of how vicious and powerful the weapon of language actually is. So I don't want to quibble about semantics other than like, I think the, I think the power brokers have been really successful at saying you can't actually see the world as it is and speak to the world as it is because to do so, especially to be critical at all of what's happening over there, especially around Israel is to be anti-Semitic. And, right. and my point of view is to be a pro human peacemaker means that we become people who see the world as it is. And then actually have the courage to talk about it, not in a way that demonizes one over another, but if we're not able to tell the truth about what's happening, I'm not sure if we're going to get to the place where or you and I want to see where we are all fully engaged in a pro-human way, moving toward a just and lasting peace that protects the humanity, dignity of, of everybody here. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I don't think we're on different, different places in this. My point is just a little sub point to that, which is I don't want people to allow their fear of getting yes. the words right, prevent them from yes. speaking up. What right. we have to do is we have to speak up now. And so what's going to happen is you will get coached back. You will yep. be called horrible things from all sorts of different you people. That's going to happen right now, right? Mm -hmm. But the question is, okay, how do we respond to that? And how do we keep moving forward with our eyes on a very clear goal yes. or color, which is fundamental dignity, freedom, security for everyone, and making sure that we, as parties who are implicated and partly responsible as Americans, and for those of those on the call from come from Christian background, actually living up to their values. And so, so this is absolutely fundamental, what you're saying, and it's true. I'm just saying it's a larger project. And right now, we need to be speaking up in whatever way we can. And when somebody accuses you of something, hey, Totally. Great. Listen. Yeah. Say, okay, let me help me learn that perspective. Help me understand. And this is how we can grow now. Yeah, yeah. Ear to those of you who are listening in, I mean, understand that the work of peacemaking is not sexy. Like, in order to actually give our lives to moving the needle toward a just peace, we actually have to break agreement with stuff like image management and reputation. We fundamentally have to stop caring what people think. We have to stay vigilant in the way that we're forming. So that we're developing more pro-human, holistic understanding so that we can deploy our resources, including our words, in ways that actually create lenient and move the needle in a positive direction. But if we're going to live paralyzed by what other people think, then we're never going to say anything, much less put our bodies on the line to see violence actually come to an end. Um, right. And so uh, thank you, Greg, for inviting us into that space. I want to move now toward... U.S. American response and U.S. American Christians. I want you to, I want to create space for you to speak to this. What the latest stats that I read as of yesterday is that 61% of Americans support ceasefire. At 76% of Democrats, 57% of independents, 49% of Republicans. You know, so the majority of the American population supports a ceasefire. What lies behind the current administration's refusal? to put on the appropriate amount of pressure to move this toward a, a ceasefire? Well, I think there are a number of factors there. I do want to get to the point about what American Christians can do in this moment. But from an analytical perspective, I think, one, this administration has viewed this conflict in our relationship to Israel through a geopolitical lens and an electoral lens. So it's those two things together. So geopolitically, the Middle East has always been, at least over the last 150 years, it's been the intersection of a variety of proxy wars. Middle East has oil. This is a very cartoonish version of it, right? And so who controls oil controls a lot of the power in the world, but, you know, how much it costs, who has cheap access to it, whatnot. After World War II, you guess what? You know, a lot of other powers in the world weren't happy with U.S. USSR dom dominance and then after the demise of the Soviet Union with U.S. dominance in the world. And so right now, you've seen a lot of plays shaping up over the last decades. We can go into detail on this on another call, but between Russian and Chinese and influence through regional powers like Iran and Syria in the Middle East. So the U.S. administration first saw that, wait a second, like something big is going on here with Hamas, that this attack is probably connected at least to Iran. And if you hadn't, if you've been paying attention, China, you know, back in March, negotiating a historic agreement, a rapprochement between mortal enemies of 
Saudi Arabia in Iran. And so President Biden had been trying to push through this Saudi-Israel normalization agreement as a way to push back growing Chinese influence and by extension, Russian influence in the Middle East. So there's this big geopolitical thing, which is an old school view way of viewing the world. And the irony of this moment is that every day this continues, American dominance or American sort of role in the world is diminished. By this analysis on the geopolitical analysis, however you want to see the world, we are already in a multipolar world, meaning that like, you know, U.S. dominance is a unipolar world. Now Russia and China are gaining more, more, more dominance. And what that means is the world's going to become a much more dangerous place and already is going forward. Second space that, you know, the administration has been analyzing this through is electoral. So like, how do you get votes? I mean, President Biden has long been a staunch supporter of Israel his entire political career, and he believed in this cause, I believe, at a, a personal level and his current approach. But it's also been about how do you get votes? How do you get those votes? So very short answer is that, you know, he's assumed early on that he's going to have progressives. He's going to have Black, Indigenous, people of color votes, LGBTQ votes, Arabs and Muslims, if it's a, if it's a matchup against Trump, which all of these constituencies aren't going to want. And then he's also looked at the middle of the persuadables, particularly in swing states. He said, oh, a lot of these happen to be non-denominational Christians, quote unquote, evangelical. That word isn't my favorite word these days because I'm not sure what it means, but you know what I'm talking about. And so the political calculation there is like, wait a second. Well, if these guys are going to have to show up, well, we're going to try to get the persuadables and the persuadables are going to want to see strong leadership, unequivocal leadership, unequivocal statements. And, they're, and they tend to be pro-Israel. So that's been a lot of the analysis. What I think they didn't count for on the left is what we see across the uh, demographics is that there is this younger demographic that views the world very differently than this older demographic and does see what I was getting at earlier, which I actually think is true, that true security comes from a respect of and a platforming of human rights geopolitical level and on a local level. And that's another important conversation that we should have at some point, because most people have no idea about the history of human rights, international law, and actually the outcomes when you platform human rights, as opposed to these violent approaches, which compound these, compound the issues that we're seeing. And so what you see it with young evangelicals, for example, 18 to 29, over the last six years, you've seen a historic shift in self-identification as pro-Israel from 69 to 73%, down to around 23% via October 7th. And that's not because they've become huge supporters of Palestinian cause per se, but they have started to view the world differently and through this larger land of systemic issues, human rights, they're disenchanted with sort of the Trumpism angles of evangelicalism. And so there's a huge historic shift there. And that's where, Jared, I might, I just want to say a couple words because Bring I know a lot of your audience it's Christian. Yeah. And so there's been a lot of negativity in this conversation, which I think is actually during this moment. We are truly in a hopeless moment right now. And I believe that. And I need for us to hold that. I need to hold that because I don't see the, a clear avenue forward anywhere, given how far this has gotten and that we're likely at the beginning. But that's only if we view hope as a noun or an adjective and not as a verb. If Pastor Mitri Ra had been Bethlehem says, hope is what you do. Hope is a verb. Hope is an action, particularly in these moments that seem and are in fact particularly hopeless. And what we see right now, I think there's one way to talk about Christianity's influence on this conflict. And there's a horrific influence on this conflict that predates the Israeli-Palestine conflict. What many people don't know is that the origins of anti-Semitism, which is a scourge, that two millennia old, and that is growing today, is rooted very deeply in bastardized interpretations of Christian theology. That's a reality that we have to contend with. You, you can also contend with so many of the systemic injustices. You know, I spent a lot of time in the global South these last years, and you can go to Stellenbosch University outside of Cape Town, where the theology of apartheid was developed before it was preached in churches in Cape Town and throughout South Africa, before you had apartheid laws. Colonization was sanctified by the Pope. Slavery, you know, most reformed Christians supported slavery while it was an institution, either as they acquiesced it as God's will or saw it as a good thing, as part of, part of God's economy until after 
the Civil War. And so you can go on and on with these horrible examples of faith, and this goes for all faith, not just Christianity, but Christianity in particular for those on the call, to, to sanctify. And that's the word, to sanctify injustice and to promote something which looks absolutely antithetical to the teachings of Jesus and to the kingdom that Jesus preached. But you know what's also interesting in those moments and this moment is that all of the systems of injustice were undone by faith leaders and by prophetic voices who claimed to speak and to embody an authentic vision of Christianity and Jesus. And I really want to land there. Like, I can't do this as a true believer because I'm not the true believer. I come from this background. I absolutely believe these principles. But in terms of, you know, within a communal religious voice, but if you look at the teachings of Jesus and what he said about love your enemy, what good is it to do good for those who do good for you? Even thieves do that. If you look at the Beatitudes, if you look at these core teachings of what peacemaking means, which is for times like this, you know, when you talk about big words like genocide, we were talking about words earlier. Well, you know, how does genocide happen? And genocide is a crime that happens against people, but it only happens when we don't believe those people are people anymore. They've been so dehumanized in that moment. And this has happened to Jewish people. And we see dehumanizing of Jews again today. But it's, you know, sadly, this is happening to Palestinian people and it's happened to other people elsewhere. And so the challenge I would say for this particular audience is not to go away from a moment like this walking in shame or walking scared, but to say, hey, there's an opportunity. We have platform, we have voice, whether it's through the political analysis that we were talking about earlier, or whether it's to say, hey, somehow this space has been co-opted, but now there's an opportunity and a challenge because how different would the world look? How different would our country look? How different would the Middle East look? People who claimed to follow the teachings of Jesus actually held themselves accountable to those teachings and tried to embody them. And the one negative point I want to make there is just, you know, having spent a lot of time in the global South, like particularly South Africa and Latin America right now, is what you see is the fastest growing expressions of faith in the global South today happen to be Pentecostal Christianity, Calvinist interpretations. It's not even end time stuff, it's prosperity gospel stuff. So you go to the townships, and, you know, outside of Johannesburg and Cape Town, and now there are these mega churches there. These are the places where the anti-apartheid movement was really born and born out of the churches and their desire to have an authentic witness. And now you have these mega churches preaching prosperity gospel in these incredibly poor places with ATMs in the lobbies for people to make donations here. And so mm -hmm. what's happened is we've seen this really bizarre moment right now where Christians have become complicit in horrific injustice, you know, not just in Israel, Palestine, but elsewhere. They're key drivers politically of it now here on, in a policy that does not center human rights for Israelis and for Palestinians. And so what that also means is that this could be another moment in which during, you know, this Advent season, light in this darkness, the light, the miracle of Hanukkah, miracle of Christmas could actually be this witness standing up for the core values, the core teachings of the faith, and finding the courage to speak up, speak mm -hmm. out, organize, and do that, not because you're going to be a hero, but because it's the right thing to do. As my dad always taught me, I remind you, Isa, Jesus from Beit Sechot to Bethlehem, he always used to say, seek peace and pursue it, especially when it seems impossible. My friend, I mean, I, in my tradition, I would call that a preach, what you just did. And, and that's, that that's where I was hoping that we could go in this conversation. And thank you for calling us to it, friends who are listening in right now. If there's a word of encouragement or gratitude that you can pop into the comment thread, I think that would probably lift Greg's soul and spirits in this moment where his soul is weary. And yet in his weariness, here he is fighting like a peacemaker for us. And so if you can, and those who are listening in a recording, feel free to tag Greg in the comment thread and let him know what it, what it was that just happened to you as you listened to his voice here. Greg, I know that you need to jump off. There's a couple more things that I just want to share with folks here before concluding this time, but my brother, thank you. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your provocative call, but also your equipping invitation to take steps in the direction of peace. And, and I think what you've done for us is you're reinforcing 
that if we want to see peace, if we want to be a, about peace out here, we have to demand our ongoing conversion, our ongoing transformation. And not that we wait to get formed in order to engage, but like it starts here, you know, and, and I want to say a couple more thoughts on that here in a second, but I know you've got to jump off my friend. So thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. And thank you so much. And please, it's, I appreciate the words. My last just reminder, do hope, go out there, practice hope. Go, if your body is shaking, if you don't know the right words, the moment is now to stand up for what we know is right and what we know is true. And that is that every single life matters. Don't listen to those who would devalue Palestinian life or Israeli life. It's our time to actually stand up, hold our leaders accountable. And that the first step includes calling for permanent ceasefire now. So thank you so much. Right on, my friend. Take care. I want to close with one thought here that I'm struck in this moment, in just even in my own journey of becoming someone who can see more accurately and is on a journey of becoming, I hope, more pro-human in my vision, in the way that I'm seeing the world, in the way that I'm seeing this particular crisis. And with a pro-human understanding and vision comes a more pro-human engagement. And let me just offer this one thought in the spirit of Greg's preach there. Mark 10, there's this moment where Jesus is nearing the city gates of Jericho. And, and there's a blind man there who's sitting in the spot that he's been in probably much of his life. He's been relegated to that spot because of his physical infirmity. And, and in this passage, the blind guy named Bartimaeus is the only one who is crystal clear on who Jesus is, which is fascinating, right? And so somehow the blind guy understood that the person who was walking up had the possibility to actually fundamentally change Bartimaeus' life. And so he makes a scene that he goes crazy and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people are probably like, hey man, like live out your destiny. Nothing's going to change for you. Keep living on the obligations, our religious obligations. We'll take care of you. Let this Jesus guy move on. But Bartimaeus is undeterred and he screams again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me and gets Jesus' attention. And Jesus draws near him, which Jesus always does. I just love the way that Jesus immerses into the radical center of someone else's pain. What Jesus sees there always stops him dead in his tracks. But when Jesus walks up to Bartimaeus, he doesn't automatically heal his sight. And if you've ever had a, an encounter with, with someone who's physically blind, often you can tell that they're blind, you know? And so Jesus doesn't just walk up to the guy and heal him and move on. When Jesus draws near his ear, he asks him a question. And the question that he asks Bartimaeus is, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I want to see. And that unlocks the healing. The acknowledgement that I am blind and I cannot see is what began to unleash the healing. It is what began to change his life. And I'm just wondering, folks, for we who have been socialized into a religion that dominates, um, how has that shaped our ability to see? How has that limited our ability to see the humanity, dignity, and image of God another? How has it shaped the way we're seeing this particular crisis? How is it shaping the way that we're seeing the outcome and the ways in which it might be self-serving to us at high cost to another. Are we people like Bartimaeus who have the courage to acknowledge that my perspective is not yet 2020, that I am never fully right and always partially wrong? Can we have the courage to say, I want to see? And then in relationship with people, especially people who are suffering, is that the space where Jesus might not be healing or suffering? and then moving us into a more pro-human, radical, costly, and creative way of life, love, and leadership. And so I want to leave us with that. That's what we're trying to do with these virtual immersions, is to just simply bring perspectives from our Israeli and Palestinian peacemaking friends who are in various trenches in this crisis to help heal our sight as followers of Jesus so that we can follow him more accurately. And I'll close with this. Many of you have met or have heard of Daoud Nasser of the Tent of Nations, and he says it this way. He says, the moment that American Christians follow the Jesus that you talk about, this conflict will be over. And I really believe that there's some truth in that. And that requires our ongoing formation, friends. So let's keep pressing in. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for listening in. Share it. Make sure other people get to hear it as well. And let's continue the formation. Let's continue the journey toward a just and lasting peace. Until next time, friends.